Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Slave, and I direct the Future of Iran Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. Let me begin by wishing everyone the best no ruse possible under the circumstances. Uh, it's been a hard year for all of us, but especially for the people of Iran. And I hope uh, that the future for Iran is brighter, and I hope that uh, perhaps there can be some relaxation of tensions between the United States and Iran. Um, now, Iran, as you know, uses an ancient solar calendar. And according to that calendar, this year's spring solstice will mark the beginning of the year 1400, a new century. Um, so we thought this would be a good time to look back and look forward. Uh, it's fair to say that the past century has been incredibly tumultuous for Iran with significant triumphs and also significant setbacks. Iran's long quest for independence from foreign powers, for development and prosperity, and for a more representative and humane form of government has certainly made progress at times, but it's also been uh, stymied frequently by Iranians themselves, although sometimes with foreign countries playing a rather mixed role. So we put together what I think is a really fantastic panel of Iranians to talk about their country as it marks this, uh, this turning point, inflection point, as we like to say at the Atlantic Council. And I also invite everyone to go to our Iran Source blog, where we have three pieces on this topic, uh, two of them by Nadere Shamu and Sina Azori, who will be speaking today. There's also one by Borzoi Daragahi, who is another uh, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. And finally, there's, uh, there's a piece by uh, Shal Bakash, uh, one of Iran's great historians and the author of an excellent new book on the life of Reza Shah in exile. So we're gonna start with Nadere Shamlu, who, as I mentioned, is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And she's also a former World Bank official and development expert. Uh, and this, is, uh, this, this uh, whole event, frankly, was Nadere's idea. Um, after Nadere, we're going to go to someone who is new for us here at the Council, but someone I've admired from afar for a very long time. And that's Sada Ziba Kalam, a professor at the University of Tehran, who is joining us from Iran with connections, uh, hopefully uh, still good. He has written and spoken quite thoughtfully and often critically about events in his uh, country. And we're looking forward to his remarks. Then Sina Azodi, a non-resident fellow at the Council and a frequent contributor to our blog, for his reflections as a millennial who uh, was raised in Iran and came here as a, a young man. And finally, an old and dear friend uh, and a stellar analyst of Iranian politics, Mirzad Borogerdi, who directs the School of Public and International Affairs at Virginia Tech. Uh, I got to know him when he was a professor of political science at Syracuse University's Maxwell School, and he's written a number of fabulous books and edited uh, books on Iran, including most recently, Post-Revolutionary Iran, a Political Handbook. So, Nadere, it's over to you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for this uh, kind introduction and also for hosting this event at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I think that uh, it is uh, it, it is my great uh, pleasure and honor to be on this uh, um, on this panel. And uh, without much ado, let me just uh, throw out a few ideas. And I hope that uh, the um, the other panelists, the other esteemed panelists uh, that I have the pleasure to be on, uh, will either react or contradict or maybe even uh, you know uh, uh, propose their own ideas. Um, I, Earlier today, as you mentioned, uh, one of my blogs was posted on the Atlantic Council where I kind of compare the challenges Iran faces today with the challenges that Iran faced uh, a century ago. Uh, of course, the country is a very different country back then in, in early, uh, well, in 1920s or the year 1300, Iran was about, uh, had about a population of about 5 million of which about, you know, let's say less than 5% were literate and about 90% were rural, uh, very little, um, urban population, there was a big um, poverty and so on. 
And today, of course, Iran has about 85 million with another 5 million supposedly uh, Iranian diaspora across the world. Uh, the younger generation of Iranians have about 98% literacy. And of course, Iran is a much richer country today. But I think that some of the uh, challenges that we faced back then um, are still around. And I, will, I would like to categorize them into three formidable challenges and one super challenge that I will explain right now. Well, the first formidable challenge is, of course, about government or governance. Um, as many of you may know, the constitutional revolution uh, of 1906 and 1911 was a very aspirational uh, piece. Uh, but nonetheless, it had uh, and, and it, the, its purpose was to essentially balance the power between uh, or take it away from the court or from the king and, and vest it into the parliament. But in between uh, the position of the executive, that means the government, the ministers, the, the prime minister, was not well defined uh, according to the constitution. The king had the, had the power to appoint and, and dismiss uh, uh, prime ministers, but so did also the, the the, the majlis. And so there was this revolving door uh, government. And in, in the end, the government was not neither representative because it was an appointed government, nor was it a very effective government. Today, we face something slightly, uh, I mean, it's slightly different, but still the same problem in the sense that, okay, today, the government, the presidency, and the, the ministers, the cabinet, the president is elected by the people. But his uh, role and also his powers and his accountability is not well defined because it is being undermined or overshadowed or whatever we may want to call it by non-elected bodies. And in the end, again, Iranian people don't have as much of a say in the kind of policies or in the kind of, uh, or they have marginal say in the kind of policies that the government can um, uh, can pursue. So again, we still are still at the at the stage where we need to uh, to kind of have a representative government that comes to power or is is di dismissed by the people uh, for the people, and it's, we still are still struggling with that. The second challenge that I uh, see is economic security and economic inclusion. Again, back then, Iran was a very poor country, largely agrarian, uh, with the exception of a very thin layer of the oil industry. And again, it was a very thin layer of the oil industry. The rest was very agrarian. Uh, and there was this vast uh, income inequality, with the exception of, of the aristocracy and some elite. The rest of the uh, country lived in apps in almost absolute poverty. Today, Iran, uh, of course, is a richer country, but uh, and the middle class has, has grown. But still, there is a big uh, perceived, if not even real, but perceived uh, income inequality. People see a vast uh, uh, class, uh, class differences. And uh, there is a perception, or, although there is absolute poverty is still there, but it's much more uh, to a much lower degree or much lower share, but still there is a large degree of relative poverty. So we still have to work on the issue of uh, greater inclusion of everyone in, in the economy and a better distribution of Iran's wealth among its people. The third challenge that I see is uh, that back then in the 1920s, uh, in the beginning of the century, we were at loggerheads with two superpowers, with uh, Russia, or although to a decreasing uh, degree because of the Bolshevik Revolution, but still with Russia and with the, with the UK. Um, you know, our policies, internal policies, internal politics were more or less uh, structured or being influenced by those, by the, by the effort to balance these two powers. Today, we are still at loggerheads with another superpower. And even though we are trying, uh, you know, even though there is a kind of the slogan that we have more estetlal, we have more independence, but we are still uh, trying to balance the, the negative or the whatever the effects of the United States or our, our confrontation with the United States. Fortunately, it still is a cold confrontation, not yet, or hopefully never a warm confrontation, but uh, we are trying to, uh, to balance that confrontation with uh, other superpowers, China, Russia, 
recently been India uh, to kind of balance this and and this uh, kind of um, struggle is still there. And then uh, just to be very brief, then I come to the superpower, a super uh, challenge of all, which is the inclusion of women and uh, minorities uh, in the Iranian um, society. In the 19, in the year uh, 1300, women and uh, religious minorities were um, second class citizens. The, even the constitutional revolution was essentially for Shia men. And uh, today, even a hundred years later, even though in between, you know, there was there were we had a huge push to kind of gain more and more of an equal status with with men in the society. But today, and particularly since yesterday was the International Women's Day, I, I have the right and the legitimacy to say that even today we are still um, struggling for that, and uh, and uh, we still are far from uh, being equal citizens with men. To me, it seems that the Islamic Republic, the policies of the Islamic Republic, or the polity of the Islamic Republic, is likely to resolve maybe the other challenges, the you know governance or the economic or even the foreign relations challenge. The issue with the inclusion of women or inclusion of other um, minorities which if you can count them all together would be the majority of the Iranians because 50% of Iranian of women plus of course the other percentages uh, it's a ideological um, hindrance or ideological issue that the Islamic Republic is would have a mm -hmm. very big difficulty to get over so this is what I call the mother of all um, all challenges that we still have to overcome mm. And with that, I would like to give uh, the floor back to you, Barbara, and to the, to the other esteemed panelists to, you know, have their uh, views on, on this, on this, uh, on the challenges we face now. Thank you, Nadir John. That that's a perfect way to <clears throat> set to set up the the conversation. Now, if he's still with us, uh, Professor Ziba Kalam, we would love to to have uh, your thoughts. Uh, one of the things that our blogs have uh, focused on is the the status of the middle class in Iran and how it has changed over the years <clears throat> and how important that is to the future of the country. So please, mm. the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, my, uh, I am uh, honored to be uh, on this uh, panel. I uh, sincerely thank uh, Atlant Council for uh, providing me uh, <laughs> with this uh, panel. I also wish uh, all Iranians uh, the, uh, the New Year, which as Barbara said it uh, correctly, it's the, the new century, uh, uh, 15th century for, uh, for Iranians. I like to begin by saying that uh, the beginning of uh, the last century was uh, a struggle for modernization, for political development, and above all for democracy. It manifested itself in the constitutional revolution, more or less at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the fourteenth century and uh, uh, the most important uh, goal of the, the constitutional revolution was uh, a kind of uh, democratic uh, form of government a government not uh, according to the rule of the of the ruler king uh, president or whoever but uh, by the law now for uh, for a host of reasons uh, uh, the constitutional mm. revolution uh, did not uh, materialize very much and uh, the iranian did not experience uh, did not observe the fruit of the constitutional revolution mm. which was a form of uh, democratic uh, government much of the the match of the 14th century uh, Iran, in my opinion, uh, Barbara has been 
a struggle for, uh, for uh, democracy. Uh, after the fall of uh, the Reza Shah uh, in the, uh, after the Second World War, um, nearly or, or, or rather two years before the end of the Second World War, there was, uh, there was uh, 12 years of uh, uh, a kind of democratic uh, atmosphere in Iran. Unfortunately, uh, by the coup in 1953, uh, Dr. Mossadegh's liberal government was overthrown and uh, for, uh, for 25 years, Iran was ruled um, the, under a very dictatorial style of government by the, by the late Shah. Although, although we progress in, in economy and uh, in, 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 so, uh, in, in social, uh, uh, maybe in, in social progress uh, during, the, during Mohammad Reza Shah, but as far as uh, political development, as far as uh, a form of democratic government was, uh, was concerned, unfortunately, um, the, in the words of Amnesty International, uh, Shah's government was one of the worst as far as, uh, as, far as the, the, the human right was concerned. Tri uh, Iran had one of the highest political uh, prisoner under the Shah, uh, and, and many other features which, uh, which were incompatible to a democratic uh, form of government. In my opinion, in my opinion, the Islamic revolution uh, was, uh, was actually uh, for, uh, for a better form of uh, government, for a more democratic form of government. It was for, to have a free election, uh, not to have political prisoners, uh, to have press freedom, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, for reasons uh, which, which, which I hope the Atlantic Council will, will, will hold another, um, another session like this, um, the, the object of the Islamic revolution um, the, were overrun by a very radical uh, ideas, anti-Americanism, uh, anti, anti uh, the, the, the call to, to, to destroy the state of Israel, to uh, export the, the Iranian revolution, anti-Westernization, etc., etc. These, uh, the, these, these objects, these goals uh, became very, uh, the, the, the very powerful. And as I said, they overrun the democratic object of the of the Islamic uh, the revolution. Uh, you could say that the struggle for for democracy continued uh, under the the eight years of we had the, we had then the eight years of uh, uh, of uh, reform reform the president uh, Mr. Mr. Khatami, and uh, I believe that uh, we are in the last days of the of the uh, 14th century, it would be no exaggeration, Barbara, to say that, um, that we entered the, 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 the 14th century uh, with, uh, with the struggle for democracy in Iran, and we are ending the, the, that century, uh, still we are struggling uh, for, um, uh, for democracy and democratic values um, the, 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 in Iran. As far as challenges are concerned, in my opinion, Iran is facing three fundamental challenges. Uh, I call it the uh, ethnical division. Uh, the, 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 the country is, is deep rooted in, uh, in, in ethnicity and uh, the, 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 there hasn't been any political uh, development um, to modify uh, the call for ethnicity. Um, the, when the revolution happened 40, 40, uh, 42 years ago, Barbara, we had one ethnic group which, uh, which challenged the central government, the courts. Unfortunately, after 42 years, it's not the court alone. We had Azaris, we had Sunnis, Baluchis, Arab, and uh, because, as I said, because of uh, due to the lack of political development, unfortunately, ethnicity has become a fundamental 
uh, problem in, in today's Iran. The second division, the second crisis, the second problem is the economic uh, uh, problem. In my opinion, uh, the, the, the wealth division, uh, the, the Jenny coefficient of, 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 of economy, unfortunately, has deteriorated. The rich has become richer in Iran during the past 42 years. The poor has become much poorer in Iran again uh, the, the, during the, the, the past uh, 42 years. And in my opinion, the third division, the third threat is uh, what I call cultural division, cultural contradiction, which Iran uh, would be facing uh, the, the dangerously in future. The division between the religious Iranian who are very religious and they are ready, that they are prepared to do anything uh, for the Islamic government and, uh, and in sharp contrast to, to the religious Iranian, you have uh, other Iranian, the, the more educated Iranian who, uh, who are completely uh, as I said, irreligious. They have they have become irreligious as a result of the performance of the of the Islamic regime. So these these three threat, these three division, uh, ethnic division, economic division, and cultural division. They are uh, they are uh, the pitfall. They are the danger of of Iran as it, as Iran uh, would enter into fifteenth uh, uh, centuries in. Uh, in, in more or less uh, uh, 10 days time. And in my opinion, the remedy for all these uh, the problems is political development and uh, uh, democracy. I again, thank you for uh, having me on your program. Thank you so much. I, I should tell people that we have a Q&A function. I see some people are mm -hmm. starting to put their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So please do. and and say whether there is a question for a specific uh, person. We will get to that. Uh, uh, Professor Zibakalam, I have to ask you one follow-up, and that is, of course, we at the Atlantic Council and me as an American and non-Iranian obsess about US policy and the impact of our policies on Iran. Um, is it fundamentally a question of US policy at all? Uh, or is this really something that Iranians have to wrestle with themselves? Uh, unfortunately, as I said, Barbara, unfortunately, anti-Americanism, which was uh, uh, which was a legacy of the uh, of the of the left uh, Marxist left in Iran, it was transformed uh, very much uh, to to uh, they inherited. The, the fundamentalist, uh, the, the, the the Islamic radical, if you like, they inherited much of the much of the leftist uh, ideology and uh, anti-Americanism of, of uh, the, or, or American imperialism, which was uh, which was a big motto in Iran during the revolution by the by the Marxist uh, mm. the, 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 the currents in Iran, unfortunately, mm. was inherited by the mm. by the Islamists. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to turn now to to Sina uh, Azori, who uh, lived in Iran as a, a, a as a child and a teenager. Uh, you're a child of the Iran Iraq War, really, um, yes. and. Uh, wanted to, to ask you, and this kind of flows from the discussion of anti-Americanism, the ideological component of the Islamic mm -hmm. Republic, which uh, the, the notions of grandeur, the notions of empire, uh, which the Islamic Republic inherited from the Shah, but gave a, a different twist and gave a, an ideological and a religious twist. If you could talk to that a little bit and where you see that, that going, is there is there any counterbalance to that now that we're seeing from the region, particularly um, as we see more and more Arab countries openly recognize the state of Israel? Uh, thank you, Barbara, for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, on your question, I, I really think that this anti-imperialism, which has presented itself in the context of you know the, the, the revolution's anti-Americanism, it goes back to the uh, experiences of the 20th century where uh, some of the challenges, as, as uh, Nader men, uh, mentioned, was to really how to deal with the, the great powers of the time. 
uh, one of the important challenges that the Iranian faced in the 20th century was how to deal with the great powers uh, who, for the sake of their own interests, sacrificed or, or uh, really uh, stole Iranian resources. Uh, they, in, for example, in 1907, the Anglo-Russian uh, Treaty of Carp, basically, which, which uh, they carved up the Iran, um, the nationalization of oil. All of these, uh, they present themselves in the context of independence and, and cutting off uh, foreign hands uh, from Iran. Early in the 20th century, you see the, uh, the United States being the benevolent power and as a counterbalance to, uh, to the Brits and to the Russians who were, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, ripping off Iran of its uh, resources, or as some put it, sucking off the blood of Persia. Now, that, tran uh, that transformed after the, the 1953 coup, where uh, United States replaced Great Britain as a dominant power. So uh, the, the anti-American uh, aspect of the Islamic revolution, which as I said, was in the broader context of being anti-imperialism, anti-great powers, it was in a sense in a response to the question of independence uh, and Iran's uh, yearning for standing on its own feet. Many in Iran back then believed that if we cut off foreign hands, if we push the foreigners out of Iran, we can have a prosperous country. We are not prosperous, we are not independent, uh, because foreign powers are in our country. That, as I said, uh, um, presented itself in the revolution, in the ide ideological aspect of the revolution, that the United States was now the enemy. The, the years of, of the Shah and human rights abuses of the time was the uh, product of the United States uh, and its uh, interference in Iranian affairs. And again, this, this has nothing to do with the United, it's the United States itself. It really has to do with the Iranian mindset that we need to push the foreigners out of Iran to be able to uh, prosper. And, and this, uh, this of course, during the uh, after the revolution, um, I mean, during the Iran Iraq War, even uh, you know, it it morphed into a desire to spread the, if not the system, then uh, aspects of the system certainly to uh, Arabs, in particular Shia Arabs uh, uh, around Iran and in the Middle East, uh, beginning with Hezbollah and so on. Where do you see that going, this, this, um, this uh, expansionist uh, instinct in Iran, which, uh, which has caused, of course, a lot of consternation, particularly among Arabs, mm. uh, and faced a lot of pushback? I think this has to do with really how Iran views itself and the region. Um, and I really like to mention that, um, as many know, Iran, for much of its, its history, has been an imperial state and it identifies itself with its imperial achievements. Now, that empire has ceased to exist, but Iranian rulers, be it the Shah, be it the, the clerical leaders, they still view Iran as an imperial state and act accordingly. Now, does Iran have the, the power and the capability to act as an empire? No, obviously not, but it still behaves like one. And that is why you see Saudi officials, and I think it was, uh, the former foreign minister, Adel al Jobay, who said that, the, that Tehran wants to reestablish the Safavid empire. Now, this shows how the Arab leaders view Tehran and how Tehran is still behaving. So my understanding is that in the next century, you will still see that Iran behaving like an imperial state, which uh, because of its history, uh, views itself as a natural hegemon of the region and, and a country that has to be recognized as, an, uh, as a very important player. Now, from what I've seen in the past uh, 10 years is that every time great powers, and namely the United States, they go to Iran and ask for assistance, they don't usually turn them down. Uh, they provide assistance, especially after the 9-11 or on ISIS. But every time has, Iran has been excluded 
from regional calculations, Iranians have made it very clear that they are the players in the region. And there are many examples when, for example, when the United States excluded Iran from the, uh, 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 the conference in Spain on the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace, Iranians started, uh, escalated their interference in um, the peace process. Just to make the point that we are an important player and you cannot have stability in the region without Tehran. Now, uh, this is a, I believe this is a true statement. Uh, you cannot have peace and stability without Iran. But at the same time, I believe that Iran cannot have peace and stability and prosperity without the region, without the, 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 the major Arab countries of the region. All right, thank you. Let me turn now to, uh, to Merzad. Um, who has followed uh, very closely the, the political and intellectual trends that we've seen in Iran, particularly uh, since the revolution. Um, my first visit to Iran was in 1996, just at the beginning of the, the reform period when there was a lot of um, optimism that Iran could somehow take this unwieldy system of Valiati uh, Faki and turn it into something that was more representative of popular opinion. Uh, but uh, but we all know how it turned out. So, Mirzad, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Barbara and the Atlantic Council for this opportunity to be with you here. Um, I would like to um, paint with a broad brush uh, some of the um, enduring political and intellectual trends that we have seen in the uh, 20th and 21st century and talk about some of the similarities and differences. So. Broadly speaking, when we look at Iran's history, we know that for much of its history, uh, Persian uh, artists, literati, philosophers, they have had to deal with two types of censorship. One was the absolutism of the state, and the other was, was the fanaticism of puritanical clerics. And in that sense, unfortunately, not much has changed. Uh, when we look at the history of Iran in the 20th century, what we see is that the last century basically testifies to the fact that still uh, the Iranians are advocating for such things as freedom, rule of law, limits on the power of rulers and clerics alike, are struggling about against the two twin problems of foreign interference and domestic despotism. And in my view, neither one is less significant than, than the other. And diminishing the importance of one is really leads us to <clears throat> um, uh, you know, not understand Iran properly. When you look at the discourse today in Iran, people are still criticizing the state for what? For authoritarianism, censorship, nepotism, fanaticism, influence peddling, partisanship, violence. What are they demanding? Accountability, civil rights, democracy, limited state, social justice, tolerance, transparency, a fair legal system, and things of that sort. So one can say, broadly speaking, there is a, there is a lot that remains the same, uh, regardless of how things have, have, have changed. We are still, uh, whether you are a secular or a religious Iranian, it seems that uh, the memory of a resplendent past uh, still is captivating, right? The, the, the hedonistic and mystical Gnostic uh, Persian poetry uh, remains unrivaled in terms of its, you know, popular appeal, no, no matter, no matter what. Um, for the secular nationalist of Iran, um, as was the case in the early 1900s, it is still the case, uh, Islam and Arabs remain as favorite targets of criticism. Um, so, so not much has changed in terms of, you know, that, that discourse. Um, we are still predominantly, our intellectuals are still predominantly talking about notions of qualified assimilation of the West, that we don't want to be apishly imitating everything that comes from the West, but rather we want to be selectively choosing, right, the, the, those qualities that might, uh, you know, lend themselves to uh, a, a acculturation into the Iranian uh, type of uh, uh, context. We are still worried about the outside world. A century ago, right? Radio, cinema, cars, tape recorders, and oil burst on us suddenly. And nowadays it's the internet, the cell phone, and, you know, Facebook and everything else, and the problems that, that those have brought with them uh, uh, as, as before. Uh, then, as, for, as well as now, 
some of the most important intellectual works in Iran are being done outside the country, which I think is quite interesting among, among you know, expats. But there are also, you know, big differences, I think, compared to the past. Um, unfortunately, I must say, the superb intellectual statements of a century ago that we used to have are nowhere to be found. The, the current cadre of leaders in Iran, in my view, are jokes compared to the men of, you know, the, the caliber of uh, uh, Zokal Molke Furuhi or Tariz or, or others, others like that. Uh, very poor imitations. By the same token, intellectuals no longer uh, have that respected, are, are no longer viewed as that respected reference group that they used to be, right? They are competing for attention with all sorts of other celebrities that are out there. Again, understandable as far as uh, how Iran's uh, educational scene has really uh, been, been altered over, over the years. Uh, there are differences, as Nadir pointed out. You know, we have gone from a few hundred Iranians, you know, living outside the country to millions now, right? And that type of intellectual intercourse that goes in between folks outside and inside the country, I think has been uh, fundamentally significant in, in, in this regard. As far as the 79 revolution, I, I think it's fair to say that the profound economic, cultural, social, political transformation that the revolution brought with it has endowed Iranian politics with a degree of sophistication and multidimensionality, multidimensionality that was previously unimaginable, right? This is a much more sophisticated citizenry. The intellectual classes are much more acclimated with ideas, concepts uh, that have you know, originated from uh, outside the country. Um, discussions of identity, power, legitimacy, minorities, are much more sophisticated now compared to you know, what there was. We now have you know, female novelists, journalists, authors, poets, directors, and photographers that have burst on the scene and are you know, influencing things. So a lot has also changed despite all the, all the uh, changes. And one other important factor, I think, which we should not lose sight of, is that with the 79 revolution, the clerical establishment, and in my view, Shiite jurisprudence, became ambushed by politics and became entrapped in the epistemological labyrinth of modernity. Clerics became state functionaries. And therefore, the criticism that is levied against state functionaries everywhere now included you know, this esteemed class of clerics. So if you ask me what lessons have we learned, I will say the following. Um, you know, as the saying goes, judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgments. And boy, have we made bad judgments uh, over, over the last you know, uh, uh, century. Um, I'm reminded of the famous saying that experience is a good teacher, but her fees are very high. And apparently we have paid really high you know, fees in, in this regard. Transition from monarchy to the Republic did not say goodbye to authoritarianism. Alas, that's, that's what happened. Nativism, which I have written about you know, in terms of an idea uh, did not become the panacea for our problems, you know, to, to, to cherish what is authentic and indigenous basically meant, you know, we had other types of problems to, to deal with. Revolution did not bring economic prosperity or into individual freedoms with it, right? And therefore, you know, a theocratic state, it, many argue, has really failed miserably as it turned religion into an ideology with all its, well, it, all its shortcomings. So in the interest of time, let me conclude by saying that, you know, I want to be hopeful, right? As they say, hope is the only capital of the unfortunate. And uh, one would hope that with Iran's, you know, educated um, urban and young population, one can be, you know, hopeful. But in this day and age, you know, I find myself, frankly, more in agreement with the dejected tone of the following short poem by one of Iran's leading literary scholars, uh, Mr. Dr. Shafi'i Katkani. This is the poem. A child named Happiness has long vanished. She has perky eyes and hair as long as my dreams. Whoever knows anything about her whereabouts, let us know. Here is our address, Persian Gulf to our south, Caspian to our north, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's, I think, Shafi'i Katkani has nicely summed up 
how I feel this in this day and age. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was lovely. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. I'm going to go to some of your questions now. And, and I have one. This is from an anonymous attendee for Dr. Ziba Kalam. Do you believe the Islamic regime has the capacity to go back to the core objections of the revolution? Remember, this was fought not just for independence, but, but also to, to raise the downtrodden and to make Iran uh, a, a more uh, equal society. Yeah, it's uh, one of the uh, deepest and, uh, and uh, the, the, the hugely important uh, uh, question, discussion amongst Iranians. Uh, the question is, uh, Barbara, uh, very, to, put, to put the question very simply, Barbara, is that is the Islamic regime capable of reform? Or, 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 or no, it, it isn't capable of, of reform. Obviously, uh, the, the many younger generation, uh, the Iranians, uh, many Iranian expatriates who, who live uh, outside the country, uh, royalists, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they say no, uh, but this regime is not capable of carrying out any reform. Therefore, there must be a revolution. The Islamic regime must be overthrown. In my opinion, the question is, the question is not whether or not the regime is capable of being reformed. We must force it to reform. This is the job of Iranian intellectual, of Iranian reformists, and uh, of Iranian writers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because to overthrow the Islamic regime, the whole country would go backward. Those uh, those divisions that I mentioned during my talk will uh, will destroy uh, the Iran. Iran would become worse than Iraq. Iran would become worse than Syria. Iran would become worse than Afghanistan. And those divisions that, that Barbara uh, uh, I mentioned, if the central government for any reason is overthrown, um, I, I really don't think that anything would be left uh, of Iran. Therefore, for the sake of Iran itself, we must try to reform the existing Islamic government, the, the, the existing Islamic establishment by reform. We have no other option. That is extremely, uh, extremely well said. <laughs> um, you have mentioned the divisions. I'm going to go to, to Nadari. We have a, a, a question about, uh, about religious minorities. And as we know, uh, the Iranian state recognizes uh, Shia Islam and Sunni Islam and, uh, and Judaism and uh, Christianity, although with limitations. Uh, but there's a question here about Baha'is. And uh, if you could speak a little bit to the religious groups that have also faced a great deal of uh, oppression under the Islamic Republic and whether this can, can possibly change and we can see uh, more tolerance uh, for, for these groups. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. I, um, uh, you know, I think that the uh, religious minorities, in a way, uh, into the same category as women, in the sense that they're all yeah, second-class citizens. But then there are some who are more equal than others in terms of their second-class citizenship, and the Baha'is are probably among those who fit into the last category. Uh, yes, unfortunately, despite uh, despite the fact that under the constitution, under the Iranian constitution of today, every citizen is supposed to be equal. Um, but then there are all of these shades of, uh, unfortunately, all of these shades of uh, qualifications that put some, um, some citizens uh, behind others. I wanted just to, uh, if I can take maybe one, po one minute to maybe react to some of the points that were made uh, by some of the other uh, speakers. Um, I fully agree that, you know, we are, we now have a, uh, at, at a point in time where we have to do some introspection. Um, two points come to my mind. One is that we have been in this last century, or maybe even more than that, maybe 150 years, we have blamed 
our problems and our own shortcomings on foreign powers. We are like this because the British people were, you know, the British government wanted us to do this. We were, we are, we had high, let's say, levels of corruption because of the Americans. We had this, that. Now, after the revolution, one of the things that we can talk about, it's, there is, it's a good counterfactual in the sense that we do see that despite the foreign powers, we have corruption in, in Iran. So we have to do something about this within our own society. We have a lot of other problems that we used to blame on foreign powers, which, we, which persist after the revolution, after the Islamic revolution, which have nothing to do with, with foreign powers. So we have to really do some introspection by ourselves. The second point that I want to, to, make, is, uh, to make is that we often compare today with you know, 42 years ago of, uh, you know, uh, before the revolution. Again, I think that that's the wrong uh, uh, comparison because in many countries, 42 years ago, whatever those countries were, is very different than what, what those countries are today. Uh, let's take Korea, for instance, or let's even take uh, uh, Turkey that is next door to us. We see that the countries have progressed con continuously. If we really want to compare Iran, we should no longer compare Iran to 42 years ago before the revolution. That is the wrong counterfactual. We need to compare Iran of before the revolution, during, you know, before the Pahlavis, uh, after the Pahlavis, during the Pahlavis, to countries that were then uh, Iran's comparators or peers, and we need to compare today Iran with those uh, with uh, those countries. And one thing that I would like to add is that, you know, just I'm coming back to economics in the Middle East right now. Saudi Arabia and Turkey uh, are ahead of Iran in terms of their, you know, the ranking of their GDPs in terms of the size of the GDPs. Turkey, because of its 85 million people of uh, you know pop, uh, population and of course an economy that is very diversified and not based on oil and saudi arabia is um, you know is ranking i think it's 16 or 17th in the world right behind turkey basically because of the size of its oil reserves and its oil industry now can you imagine where iran could have been and what sort of benefits iran could have had for its population if we had, if we could have combined the 85 million dollar, 85 million population together with our power, power as a second uh, or third largest oil, um, oil country, uh, bo both in terms of uh, ability to produce as well as reserves. So I think that the fact that we are now today number 30 or something close to that uh, tells me that we have far under performed um, compared to where we could have been and where we should have been just basically because we are not taking care or we are not looking at our own shortcomings and blaming uh, other issues and other people and other cu countries for our own um, uh, you know mistakes and hopefully those will be some of the judgments and uh, and experiences that we can use for the next gen century Zina, let me come back to you uh, as a as our uh, representative of the millennials. Uh, uh, something about the, the the rise and fall of of hopes in Iran. Uh, I think we were talking before, and you said that um, that the, you voted once, and that was in two thousand one for Mohammad Hatimi. Yes. Um, that that experience uh, has it disillusion people permanently. I mean, we certainly saw 2009 people came out massively after, after that election when Ahmadinejad uh, took it from, from Mousavi. Um, and I also have a question in the Q&A if you could address about, about uh, the problem of addiction in Iran. And I think uh, this may not just be millennials, it may be throughout the society, but this is certainly, uh, uh, narcotics addiction has certainly become a huge uh, problem for uh, for the Iranian society. So I'll I'll put that one at your door too. Okay, I'll try that one too. Um, so when it comes to the hopes of the reform, uh, I do remember when uh, uh, Hatami came to power. I was very young, but I remember uh, parents, everybody, uh, people around me were very hopeful that Hatami, uh, with uh, with his smile, has come to power. 
uh, his outreach to the United States, his uh, famous uh, interview with the CNN, which for the first time an Iranian official, the second highest Iranian official, had admitted to the uh, uh, wrongdoing of the hostage taking in 1979. He did not apologize, but he, he got as close as he could in apologizing. Uh, so a lot of people were hopeful. Um, I remember my parents, my relatives, uh, friends uh, talking, and uh, many were hopeful that um, things will change. I remember sitting in a class and our teacher said, uh, 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 let's vote. Hopefully we can change things in the country. Uh, and, and Khatami tried, but, uh, but, but failed, really. Uh, some, uh, because of domestic uh, uh, pushback from the hardliners. And some of it, I would say, uh, his unfortunate luck. Mm. And uh, uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, changed everything. Iran did distance itself from 9-11. It did cooperate with the United States. But, the, but again, the Khatami's unfortunate luck, it was the time where uh, uh, the American hardliners, the neocons, were in power. And uh, the infamous axis of evil, um, it really um, changed everything in Iran. Um, and the hopes of maybe improving relations with the United States, I think, were shattered back then. Um, and again, I, I, I do not, this was not either Khatami's fault or anybody's fault. It was rather the unfortunate or tragic uh, cycle of events or presidential cycles uh, in Iran and the United States, where every, when um, everybody, when there's an administration in the United States which tries to reapproach Iran uh, with a, a gesture of um, cooperation or friendship, rather, Iranians push back. And when the time changes, Iranians are ready to engage with, with the United States, as it did it happened during Khatami. Uh, the administration in Washington is not really ready to engage with Iran. So yes, the hopes of improving relations with the United States uh, were shattered. Now, this has nothing to do with domestic affairs that the hardliners in Iran pushed back against Khatami and his reforms. But uh, these two factors, I believe, uh, um, really diminished the hopes of uh, making fundamental changes. Yes, I remember, uh, uh, newspapers, you know, uh, the, the judiciary would shut down one newspaper and then, you know, the, the Ministry of Culture would issue another license to the staff of the same newspaper and they would go uh, start a new one. Uh, things like that did happen. Uh, uh, society did change. Uh, the, the coverage of uh, women in, in the streets changed uh, substantially. Uh, even, again, as a uh, 17, 18 year old uh, kid, I, I could recognize that things have been changing. But as I said, again, uh, there was a pushback from the inside and there was a, a rather unfortunate uh, uh, settling of events between Iran and the United States, which neither was the Washington's fault, neither Tehran's. It was rather unfortunate. Now on, on drug addiction, I am not expert on an issue. I, I'll just tell you my uh, thoughts on that. I think uh, setting aside the issue of opium and traditional um, uh, addiction problems that have long existed in Iran, the, uh, the, the surge in, in rather modern uh, narcotics in Iran has to do with you know, the younger generation trying to uh, mimic what's happening in the West. You know, they throw parties. Uh, fortunately, I've never attended one of those, but <laughs> I've heard uh, that uh, there's so many uh, drugs available and cheap, um, and people just use them. Yeah. Well, it's not a problem just in Iran, I'm afraid. Um as we well know. We, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to give both Merzad and uh, Professor Ziba Kalam the last word. Uh, the question is, how do you promote reform in Iran? I mean, if we agree that, uh, that violent regime change is not the answer and certainly foreign intervention is not the answer, how do you do it? And uh, so uh, Merzad, maybe a couple of words and then we'll leave the last, uh, the last word to Professor Ziba Kalam. I think that this is the million dollar question, right? Uh, whether, whether this theocratic regime 
has the capacity for, for reform. You know, if you want to take the pessimistic uh, outlook, one can say, well, you know, let's look at the track record. I mean, we have been talking about Mr. You know, Khatami and, and others since 1997. But show me where have the reformists made any inroads in challenging the authority of the supreme leader, in making the judiciary more accountable, in making the IRGC Revolutionary Guards more transparent in terms of their you know, hidden economies, et cetera. Unfortunately, the answer to all those questions is that they have failed miserably, right? In other words, that the regime has, has, you know, is no, has no interest in power sharing, in becoming more transparent, in reforming itself, right? So here, I think the burden, you know, we cannot be challenging the people who are dissatisfied with the state. If the state is remaining irresponsible, right, uh, and doesn't answer to popular demands, what do you expect? A, first of all, what happens in the first uh, stage is a loss of legitimacy, right? And I think, you know, again, we will be uh, living in loony world if we do not want to acknowledge the legitimacy problem of the Islamic State. That's number one. Second list, where is the boiling point? And do you understand, you know, where that red line is if you are, you know, a statesman, right? Again, I think here, what, going back to the point I was making before, unfortunately, I do not see among the Iranian elite people of the caliber, right, who could, who could recognize where that boiling point is. So, you know, regardless of what I want or Dr. Ziba Kalam wants, et cetera, et cetera, I think we need to we need to embrace ourselves that the present course can lead to you know more trouble down the road, if not a revolution, but you know long series of popular uprisings. As we have seen, the frequency of those protests has been up last three years. Every single year, there has been an occasion for people to come out, you know, in in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, right? So I think the, the, the regime is also responsible for, you know, preventing us from, you know, reaching that point or point of no return. Yeah. Dr. Zibkam, if you could, could comment and, and also if you have any thoughts on the upcoming uh, presidential election in Iran, is it, is it meaningless? Uh, you know, Iran does have politics. What, what should we expect? Barbara, uh, the majority of the social um, uh, classes uh, who tend to support, have, have tended to support the uh, uh, reformists in the past, because of the uh, horrible experience that we had with the President uh, the Rouhani, will not take part in the upcoming election which would be in about four months time uh, from now. It means that, uh, in other words, the 24 million people who voted four years ago, nearly four years ago, for uh, Mr. Rouhani, uh, many of them would not take part in the, in the coming election. That leaves the room open uh, for the supporter of the, of the hardliner whom with, uh, with the tiny minority would actually uh, will have the, the, the new president in Iran in, in about four or five months time uh, from now. Now, that means that all the, all the power, uh, the, the, the judiciary, uh, the parliament, Iranian majlis, legislative, and the, the, and the presidential uh, the, the power would be at the hand of the hardliners. Now, many reformists say that uh, actually it's not a, such a bad scenario because at the moment, all the decisions, all the important decisions, all the, the, the principal decisions, uh, be it in, in international uh, relation, domestic economy, et cetera, et cetera, is actually taken by the hardliners, but they are not responsible. They are not. Uh, they, they are not uh, accountable to, to to all these uh, the decisions that they are uh, that they are uh, making. Who is accountable? Uh, Mr. Rouhani is accountable. Uh, 
and, uh, um, the, and, and, and many reformists are saying that let us have a radical, a hardliner as the president so that, so that the hardliner for the first time uh, has to answer to people, they must be accountable. Because at the moment they do, as I said, they do everything and they are not accountable uh, uh, for it. So in my uh, opinion, the next president would be a hardliner. Uh, a hardliner. Uh, he, he might be from revolutionary guard. He might be from the civilian section of the hardliner. It doesn't matter. He would be a hardliner. Now, as to the as to the question of uh, the the, uh, the the past experience, as Mehzad, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bruger has said that uh, the past experience um, has proved that uh, the, the Islamic regime is incapable of uh, of uh, developing towards a, a, a more accountable uh, government. Barbara, the point is that the point is that everyone like to uh, like to, to the they all criticize and rightly they, they say that this is the first fault, this is the second fault in the economy. The Islamic regime has done so badly in foreign relations, international relations, it has failed, etc. etc. But they don't give you any solution, any alternative. What is to be done? What should we do? Should we should we go? towards the overthrow of the Islamic regime, which I told you would be ruin, uh, not for the Islamic regime, but for Iran. Or should we try, should we try to reform from within the state? The problem with Dr. Bujerdi and many Iranians is that they have given up any hope of, uh, of the fact that this regime is capable of, uh, of any reform, as long as, as long as we are confronted with this idea that the Islamic regime is not capable of, uh, of carrying out any reform uh, the, the, in that regime, obviously we would not be able to, to, uh, um, to, 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 to progress. So the first point would be to believe that, to believe that, that this regime is capable of undertaking political reform. Well, I think that's a, a, a good note to, to end on. Uh, it's spring, it's going to be no ruse, and we have to be hopeful, especially after the, the horrible year that the whole world has been through. Uh, I could carry on this conversation all day, but unfortunately, we have to, we have to stop here. Let me thank so much uh, everyone who's participated. Uh, and particularly, uh, Professor Zibakam, I hope we will be able to have you back for other conversations. And I hope I'll get to meet you someday in person if I ever get a visa <laughs> to go back to Iran. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Inshallah. Well. Inshallah. Inshallah. Be happy well and be safe, everyone. And happy thank new you. year to all. Uh, happy, happy new year. year. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.